Yeah, as Chris says, this talk is about feature toggling. Um, I've called it subtitled continuous delivery done right because I thought making continuous delivery uh, great again was a bit cheesy these days. Uh, I'm going to be drinking a lot of water because I've got a bit of a sore throat, so please bear with me during that. Um, this talk I've done for a few different audiences. Um, it's not particularly technical, so if you're not a dev, don't worry too much. But can I get a quick show of hands? Like, who is enough of a developer or has been a developer that they understand what version control is? Okay, that's not bad. Who's a kind of more tester? Any testers? Just one. Two, cool. Uh, product owners? Do we have any UX people? Okay, we, we don't really have any UX people. That's good. Um, I'll give you one. <laughs> I'll give you one weird tip that they don't want you to know. You see, I've gone for a font here, we bits cut out. That makes them lighter, that makes them render faster. Shh, keep on to yourself. Um, so I, I assume you know what version control is and you're using it. If you don't know what version control is and you're not using it, I probably can't help you too much. You've got a bigger problem. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to be talking about something that I think most of you have seen, and I'm going to give you an example to start. So imagine for a minute that your team have been asked to deliver several new features to your online store. You're all in an online store now. It's not called Amazon, it's something else. Um, you've got a few things you want to do at the same time. You want to replace the payment provider. You want to integrate your user profiles with some sort of social media. You want to uh, upgrade your recommendation engine so you can sell people more stuff. And these features are all interesting, but they're not separate. The recommendation engine probably depends a little bit on the user profile. The user profile might be a bit linked into the uh, payment provider because you put payments through on people's profile, you've linked them together in some way. So you're doing different features, which might look separate, but when you get into the code, they're a little bit linked. There's a bit of a crossover. The other part of the problem is you don't know when any of them are going to be released. You don't know when each one will be finished, so you can't determine an order. Is people felt this problem before, like where you've got a few different things in parallel and you don't quite know when it's all going to come together. Um, so you need to be prepared for them to be able to live with each other and that you should be able to deliver them at any time without conflicting, even though they share similar parts. What's the solution? Before we go too deep into that, I want to go into um, a tangent, an important tangent, continuous integration. Um, I genuinely think, and I'm of the increasing opinion, that the best way to do Agile is to focus on the continuous delivery of value. Now, that's the value that a customer sees. Continuously give them the things that they want to see. That sounds like a good thing. That's pretty Agile Manifesto 101. Um, we don't tend to focus on it enough. In our context in software, continuous delivery of value usually means delivering software, so getting software out the door all the time doing it as frequently as we can possibly do. That in turn heavily implies using continuous integration. So what is it? It's broadly the notion that when we're working with other developers, that it's probably a good idea that we frequently work together and that we bring our work together so that we're still aiming for the same goals and that there are not going to be too many conflicts. So the person working on the user profile part and the person working the recommendation part where they've got this shared bit in between, it's not going to cause them too many problems. They know from bringing their work together that they're not opposing each other in the design. They're not changing things that the other person depends on or they're not adding things that are going to break the other person. So there's four steps to making that work with just basic version control. Before you make your commit, take an update from your master pull all the changes in. If there are any breaks, fix them. Commit your change so that something else, so everyone else can see them. And most importantly, automate your build process. Have another machine somewhere else that will check that your build actually works and that the thing that you committed in and that have been committed in actually work. And that's got three prerequisites, I think. Make sure that you have a test for existing behavior. Yeah? If you want behavior to exist in your system, make sure there's a test for it. Because if you don't, at some point, it will go away. 
or it will stop working in a way that you don't expect. If you've got new behavior that you want your system to start exhibiting, write a test for it before you write the code. So say, I would like this behavior. You can code that in a test. That's basic TDD or BDD. Say, I want this behavior, write it down, prove that that's what you wanted. Most importantly though, have reliable fast builds. I know I put this last, but it is the most important. If you don't have reliable, fast builds, people will stop running them. It doesn't matter that you've got tests. It doesn't matter that you've done your updates and commits earlier. If you don't have a reliable fast build, people will stop ignoring it and the whole house of cards falls apart. By reliable, I mean passes near enough 100% of the time and by fast I mean about a minute. Two minutes tops, if you're over that, you're too slow. If you need help in getting it faster, come and speak to me and I'll tell you how to do that, but I don't have time for that in this talk. But you need reliable fast builds. Why, why do we do this? Why do we uh, continuous integration? It's a form of communication. You should absolutely go and have a conversation with your teams. You should have a three amigo session. You should have example mapping. You should do whatever you, as you do so that you're all on the same page. But ultimately, those conversations are going to defer to the code. It doesn't matter what you say. If you write something different, if you don't commit it, if you don't commit to what you originally said, it's going to fall apart. Like I say, I'm not saying don't have conversations. They're super important. They're probably more important than anything else. But at some point, the communication is finalized in the code that you write. That's a very Devi perspective, by the way. If I put on another hat, I'd have a totally different argument. Um, hopefully, if you're doing continuous integration, you're going to have less conflict because you're committing frequently. Um, hopefully, at least once a day. I normally commit at least once an hour, but you want to commit frequently so that when you're doing that communication part, it happens very, very often. And any problems that are going to come up are limited to the scope of just that time. If I'm committing every hour or every day, and other people are doing the same, then the most that we're going to go in a slightly different direction is about a day, maybe less. So we get to stop and go, oh, you're doing that? That doesn't work with my design. Let's have a conversation and fix it and make it work the right way, as opposed to some of the other options we have, which we'll talk about in a second. So the traditional way of solving some of the problems that we have um, is feature branching. So the idea here is that for each of the big features you want, whether it's your, you know, your, your recommendation provider changes, your payment provider, whatever, you do them in separate branches. So you keep them apart until they're ready. That could be a couple of days, it could be a couple of weeks, it could be months, depending on how big your change is. And when they're ready and you want to go live with them, you, commit, you merge that branch of version control back into the overall master branch or you know, whatever it is you're going to ship, your shipping branch, your master branch. People have got a million names for these things. Um, and that can take time. And that can take a good long time, especially if you're using the sort of GitHub pull request model. Anyone use pull requests? Where you have to wait for somebody to do a code review, and that adds even more time if somebody bothers looking at it at all. Um, yeah, that's just more and more time. So they're, they're kind of good because they give you isolation. You know, you're guaranteed that while your code is there, it's going to work in isolation. It's also really kind of nice because you can cherry pick what you want to release. If you just want to release A or B or C, whatever your feature is, you just merge that one back and it can go out the door, hopefully. Um, yeah. The problem though is it's anti CI. You cannot do feature branching and continuous integration. They are opposed, they're diametrically opposed, despite how many people think that they're doing both. Continuous integration. Just think about the two words. Continuous means all of the time, it doesn't mean once at the end. Integration does not mean keep the things apart and separate. It means integrate them. Continuous integration means do that all of the time. You can do both. Um, and eventually you get to the problem of manual merging, which I touched on. It's error prone, it's problematic, just don't do it. In summary, so a guy called Dan Bardot, I tried to memorize this quote, but I forgot it. Um, 
Dan Bardo said, feature branching is a poor man's modular architecture. Instead of building systems with the ability to easily swap in and out features at runtime and deploy time, they couple themselves to the source control mechanism through manual merging. So he's really just saying, source control is a really bad way of controlling your app. It's a really bad way of trying to release stuff. There are better. So feature toggling, what is it? Has anyone heard of feature toggling? Did you use it? Okay, like 20% of the room, that's all right. So if you're doing feature toggling, all development happens in trunk. Yeah, you generally do trunk-based dev. There are no branches. The only branches you might have are for spiking or prototyping something, and it never gets merged back. Once you've learned whatever you want to learn in your spike or your prototype, it goes in the bin. If you learn something, well, you re-implement it properly in trunk. That's fine. Everything else happens on your main trunk branch. That means we've immediately started doing continuous integration again. If you're doing everything on trunk, you are, by definition, at least doing the integration part. And hopefully you're doing it every day, you're in the continuous part. The problem is you might think then, well, how are they isolated? How do we do stuff safely? And that's where the toggles come in. Toggles are just little pieces of code, switches, if you like, that let you pick whether something is switched on or off. And that's a simplification I'll come back to in a minute. They let you pick how code should operate. Um, for a new piece of functionality, they're pretty simple. You've got a new feature. You isolate it from the rest of your system. At the point where it joins the rest of your system, let's say, let's say we're using Java or C Sharp or something like that, you've got an interface. Well, there you just put a little toggle in that says it's on or off. The rest of the system should be able to see it or shouldn't. And this will affect every part, backend systems, the UI, you know, in a, in a web page, it's just a little if statement, really. Show this, bit of, show this link to this bit of code or not. At your back end, it's if somebody tries to call this, it will 404 or not. It will throw an exception or not. It's either on or off. It's just a little switch. If you're trying to modify something existing, like some of your payment provider examples, um, you have options. You could create two different implementations of the same overall abstraction, like an interface, like your payment provider. You might be on PayPal just now, and you might want to move to, I don't know, Amazon Payment or something like that. Well, you put a payment provider interface in front of you all and initially say, well, we're still going to our old one. Let's just put that live. Let's keep adding stuff to our new payment provider. But none of the traffic goes that way yet. It's still pointing at the old one. And we can keep committing every day, and nothing actually hits this bit of code. Now, if somebody starts causing problems and start making changes to that bit of code that are going to affect elsewhere, you still see it. The code is still there. The abstraction is there. The little links between all the code is still there. So if something breaks, you'll see it break. Your build will break, but you're not having to route traffic towards it. Deployment is not release. Deploying your code is not the same as releasing your functionality. You should be able to deploy your code as frequently as possible. Every commit should be buildable. Every build should be able to go out the door. And you should be able to release your functionality separately from that. They're different things. Now, I've been talking about toggles as kind of on-off switches, little FL statements. But they can be way more advanced than that. That's the simple version. We have toggles that allow us to target individual roles. So I can give it to admins to say, try this. Or I can give it to my testers to say, if you want this in this environment, you can have it and no one else sees it. And that's a little bit more advanced. You're doing a little bit of pattern matching there rather than just saying, is this on? You're saying, is it on? And does the user have the right role? But that's still not that hard, right? You can conceptualize how you might start to do that. You don't have to do this yourself, by the way. There's a million libraries for this. Whatever language you use, there is a library that does this stuff for you. You can start rolling out to your user base as well. So one thing that, say, Facebook do is if they've got a new feature, they roll out to 1% of users that are between age 18 and 35, that are in Edinburgh, that are women. Like They target that minutely and go, cool, that works. So let's uh, open up to men over 50 in Utah. 
okay, let's uh, increase the percentage, let's increase the geographic population, let's increase by any of the dimensions that we think about. Now, you don't need that probably, you could do it. That's powerful, that's useful. Does it make your code and systems more complex? Yes, it does. There's two paths through your system now for each toggle, at least. There are ways of managing that complexity. Try to keep the different parts separate. So rather than having a bunch of if else statements everywhere, try to create separate implementations and have just one switch so you can keep testing each part um, and then switch over when you need to. Toggles should also generally be short-lived. You don't leave them in forever. Once they're embedded, embedded in the system and you've proven them and they're live, after a few weeks, get rid of them. They're boilerplate. They're there for transition. They're scaffolding. Get rid of them. So how, how does this affect people? Devs need to be aware about what the toggles are, what the capabilities are. They need to have conversations with their product owners. They need to speak to them about what, is, what would you like to be off? What should go out just live? What should we be pushing straight away? And what should have a toggle on it? Have that conversation. If you're a tester, well, you need to get your devs to give you access to control the toggles so you can test the various scenarios. Ask them about how they think the different toggles might interfere with each other, because that could be combinatorial. It could be very problematic. You want to try to avoid that. But assume they're then lying and uh, test everything anyway, because that's what you're going to do. Uh, UXers, uh, use it to try your AB strategies, like roll stuff out to different parts of your organization. Uh, or sorry, different parts of your user base. It's a very powerful tool for UXers. And for product owners, you don't need to manage your deployments anymore. Your devs can manage deployments. They're perfectly good at that. You get to decide when stuff gets released, when it's actually ready, when you've reviewed it. It does the thing that you think it should do, and you think it's ready for an audience. So think about what this achieves. Your team can work together. They can work in the same code base. They can meet, keep moving quickly. They can avoid conflict. They get power in terms of being able to test different strategies, different ideas, different abilities. Compare that to the alternative feature branching. You're still managing complexity there. You're just not seeing it. It's because it's not all together, it's separated. You're only seeing one chunk at a time. It still exists. This makes it explicit. It makes it controllable. It makes it something that you know and are tackling head on. Thank you. <laughs>